Bom ah, dia, é Félix. Isso. Bom dia. Joia. Eu não te ouvi, Bruno. Bom dia, tudo bem? Bom dia, me ouve agora? Agora estou te ouvindo, acho que o meu estava sem áudio aqui. Perfeito. E aí, café tomado, pronto para mais um dia? Sempre, cara. Mais um dia no escritório. Maravilha, maravilha. E aí, o que, que você achou do... Do, do Scott? Ah. Excelente, cara. Muito, muito bacana a experiência dele focada no, nos lutadores, né? E dá para ver que o conhecimento dele é de outro nível, né, cara? O cara é, é muito dono do, do assunto, né? É. Você viu que o cara levou a palestra sem slides, né? Pois é. E ele até falou, mencionou de alguns slides, mas ele... Não sei se ele não compartilhou a tela ou se ele... Não, não. Ele não realmente... compartilhou a tela, nem preparou slides. Nem preparou. Ele perguntou para mim, né, se tava tudo bem. Eu falei, claro. Você tem conhecimento para ir. As duas vezes que ele deu uma palestra lá para gente no MBC foi assim. Só foi falando, foi falando, foi falando e foi conectando, conectando, demonstrando e não se apoiou em nenhum material e é muito coerente a fala dele, né, cara? Dá para você ver que ele tira do conhecimento dele mesmo. Ele não tá usando citações, papagaiando livro nem nada. O cara tem hum. aquilo, né? Sim, sim. Ele é, é impressionante. Muito, muito bom mesmo. Só peso pesado, né, cara? Já tô acostumado é. já. Pois é. O Steve, você já conhecia o Steve, não? Sim, o Steve participou de alguns dos painéis lá deles, né? Ah, Junto foi. com o Kevin e com o Brandon. Pode crer, pode crer. E aquele outro cara muito bom também que ensinou como, como fazer, como ler as pesquisas, como ler os estudos. Não tô lembrado do nome ele dele. Vai agora. ser o último aqui, Dan. O Dan, muito bom ele, cara. Ele me passou, é. ele ensinou coisas que eu uso até para pesquisar para os meus trabalhos, Legal. ferramentas do Google, né? Sim. Como ler um estudo, porque é difícil, né? Se destrinchar um ensaio clínico, é, de, é complicado. Ele ensinou a você dividir as coisas e analisar de um jeito muito mais fácil, né? Achei muito bacana também. Ele vai ser o último aqui com a gente. Show. Muito bom. Esse vai ser fera também. Já tem, deixa eu ver, eu já liberei o, o botão aqui. Ah, tá, agora tá liberado. Boa. Muito doido isso, né? Se eu já fiz a configuração, por que, que eu tenho que liberar esse botão depois? Eu acho que é até bom, cara, porque às vezes se a pessoa que você configurou antes não teve algum problema, você ainda tem essa possibilidade de atribuir qualquer pessoa como intérprete, né? Qualquer pessoa que tá na sala aqui. Espera só um minuto, cara. Bom dia, Fábio, Adenilton e Serena. Bom dia para vocês, obrigado por mais uma vez estarem aqui. Serena sempre marcando o ponto ali, ó, antecipadamente. Gosto disso, hein? Dá um alô aqui no chat, galera, só para ver se está tudo bem. Ó. O Adenilton já falou bom dia, está me ouvindo bem, som está ok, o vídeo está ok. Dá só uma confirmação aí, bom dia, Fábio. Ótimo, ok, maravilha. Perfeito, tudo ok. Maravilha, Serena. Show. Rapaz, Bruno, isso aí era um barulho de uma impressora antiga, era isso mesmo? Não, era um, era um alarme aqui, cara. Eu tô cada dia num escritório aqui, né? Então, hoje tinha um desses relógios de alarme, aí eu te liguei. Ah, tá. Parecia aquelas impressoras antigas, sabe? Sim. Bem, tá. aquilo, ali, aquilo ali, quando existia, você ainda não... Não ficava em computador, não. Você não conhece. Aquelas impressoras de fax, né? Tem alguém mandando um fax. Tá chegando um fax. Exatamente. Exatamente. <risos> Quantos anos você tem, cara? Vou fazer 18 semana que vem. Porra! <risos> Tenho 31. <risos> 31. Tá bom. Tá bom. Tá bom. <risos> Vida. 
Já volto aqui já. Beleza.
What's up, man? Hey, hey, hey. Good morning. T. Good morning. Hello. How are you, buddy? Good. What's going on? Good. I'm doing good. And you? I'm all right. All good. It's a nice weekend here. Yeah. Sunny, huh? Sunny. Yeah. Yeah. And you see Not too Bruno? hot. Bruno? I know. Bruno, Bruno what's up, man? Bruno, we cannot, we cannot hear you. You are... Uh, <laughs> Sorry for that. Okay. Just trying to do some sign language here for you guys. <laughs> I translated you in the previous panel, so yeah, I feel yeah. like I've been, in, been inside your brain already. I feel like I know you. Oh, well, this is a completely different topic, so... Okay. You'll get, so, you'll, you'll yeah. get another side of the other side of the brain, the right okay. side. Okay, so you're going to give Last me a run for my money, huh? No, cool. this... Uh, oh, there'll be more... I think there'll be more talking on this one because it's more just uh, the slides here are very simple. I just have pretty much one word on about 10 slides and then I'm just going to go and talk. But that's right. That's what this presentation calls for. So it'll be, you'll nice. be good. Nice. I trust nice. you. I don't trust Felix, but I trust you. <laughs> <laughs> well, very I good. love my one word slides. So yeah, <laughs> here I go. Have a good conversation, guys. All right. Very good. Thank you, Bruno. I like this haircut. Oh my oh, yeah. God. The puff? Wow. I hope one day have something like this. No, I don't. Come on. This is this is my uh this is my calling card. This is how you recognize me. Oh, okay. <laughs> Very good. It's part of me. Did I ever yeah. tell you this story of how my hair does this? Because I don't put gel or anything in it. So I used to have really long hair and I would put it backwards in a hat every day. And then after like two years of doing that, I got it cut. And it just like went up because it was so used to being pushed back. And it, that was like 15 years ago and it hasn't gone down yet. Very good. Yeah. When the hair is good, always works. Okay. So nine. 50 people on a Sunday. Let's go. No, we have like a, almost 300 people sign up. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's really good. Okay, I will start some uh, mm -hmm. <clears throat> introduction in Portuguese. Yep. And just give yeah, them yeah. some uh, information in Portuguese. Mm -hmm. And we'll be back for you in English. Or yeah. you can talk in Portuguese too if you want. Uh, I'm a little rusty. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Try some words. Mm, you muito, really bom, muito bom. Muito bom. Muito bom. Yeah, I mean, Ok, pessoal, bom dia. Mais uma vez estamos aqui com uma sequência de webinários nesse domingão. Hoje estamos com o Steve Bigelow, The Big Steve Bigelow. É, passar algumas instruções rápidas aqui para vocês que estão chegando agora. Caso vocês nunca tiveram a oportunidade de assistir um dos nossos webinários, algumas instruções básicas. Não utilizem o chat para fazer perguntas, perguntas no quadrinho ali do QEA, Q&A. Então, quando tiver pergunta, é lá no Q&A. Se quiser usar o botão de interpretação, tá ali, ó, Interpretation, logo do lado com aquele globinho do mundo, clica lá, você vai ver o, a bandeira de Portugal para assistir em português, né, com a tradução do Bruno. Agradeço demais a presença de vocês. Nós agradecemos, né? nós do CFSC Brasil agradecemos demais a presença de vocês. Agradecer muito aqui a presença do Bruno, mais uma vez contribuindo com essa mágica que ele faz. E agora, se você quiser a tradução, eu vou só levar aqui em inglês. So, again, my friend, good morning. Hello, good morning, Brazil. Good morning, Brazil. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate your skills here. We are very excited to have you here with, with us. And Steve, I know that you have been traveling a lot around the world, and I love this topic. I saw you talking about this at MBSC, and I realized at the moment that could be very important for Brazilians because experience around the world, always can be very important to share your knowledge with people. So if you don't know yet about Steve, Steve is a trainer at MBSC almost five years now. No, I just, we just started our, me and Vinny and Squiz just started our seventh year on Monday. Seventh, okay, seven yeah. years. Uh, Monday, huh? 
tomorrow. No, no, last Monday. So oh, last Monday already so complete. We're seven. in the we're the first week of our seventh year. It's kind of crazy. Very good, very good. And Steve is responsible for the design programs, right? Yes. Design programs. He's the guy, the brain behind the design programs. He decide who you want to do, what you want to do, and whatever. And Steve also teach CFSC around the global. Yeah. He's also our Brazilian master CFSC. <laughs> when he goes to Sao Paulo is a big moment, not just for us, but I know that he loves to go to Sao Paulo. And how many countries around the globe, Steve? Um, I think I'm pushing, I don't know, my last slide, I say thank you in all the languages of the countries I've been to for CFSC. I want to say it's like somewhere like 10 or 11. Good, very good. 10 and 11 different countries. So Steve, is a huge pleasure to have you here. And please, the videos and the camera is yours. Okay, cool. Share my screen. Oh, I need to make you attendee, not attendee, sorry. Host, co-host. Here, Steve, where are you here? More, host. Now you can share your screen. Very good. All right, so, hi guys. Again, I'm Steve. The first thing I'm thanking you on the first slide, not the last slide, because I know it's Sunday. And obviously, it's the weekend, people have stuff to do, hang out with their family. So thank you for taking time out of your Sunday morning to hang out with us, to hopefully learn a little bit and hopefully make you a better coach at the end of this and make you a better practitioner in your work, in your job, with your clients, with your athletes, with whoever you train. That's what I'm here for. Um, Feel free. I know we have a Q&A at the end, but if there's a pressing issue you have, feel free to bring it up during the presentation and I'll do my best to answer it. So how this presentation is going to work is it's very simple. It's going to be me talking a lot, which might not be the best thing. The slides aren't very heavy, right? Because I just have one word and I want to just go over these words and how these words relate. One, to international travel. So I'll say a word of something that you need to do when you're teaching people internationally, and then I'll connect that to coaching and how that makes you a better coach and what that has taught me about becoming a better coach. Okay, so what teaching internationally has taught me about coaching? This is a picture from the Great Wall of China. Cool trip. So what is coaching? Well, what comes to your head when someone says the word coaching? For me, you have teaching, you have relationships, you have openness, you have connecting with people, you have taking someone on a path to get them to where they want to go. You have to help them reach their goals. There's a hundred different things that we could say when it comes to coaching. But one thing is definitely this. You need to be able to talk, right? Your ability to speak, your ability to connect, it's all related to what you're saying and what's coming from your mouth. So when we think about international teaching, and international coaching, well, what's the first big obstacle there? If my voice is my main object of connection with my clients or with my athletes, when I go to a different country, when we go to a different country to teach someone, that's already impeded because we have a translator and we love our translators so much. They help us. We couldn't do what we do without our translator. Shout out, Bruno. But at the same time, it creates a little block in the wall. So if I'm over here, clients over here, there's a little block in between us because we can't be our 100% natural selves when we can't immediately connect with the person because of a language barrier. So this presentation is kind of going to tell me or to tell you guys what I have personally learned from learning to speak to a translator to connect with other people and what that's taught me about coaching in the gym and with my clients, with my athletes. So first one, shout out Brazil, Sao Paulo, relationships. We obviously know that in order to be a good coach, you need to build 
quality relationships. But let's start with the international teaching part. When we travel, in order for people to know that we have their best interests in mind, we need to build a relationship with that person. That's why when we go to courses, we're trying to meet everyone in the course. We want to be friends with everyone in the course. We have socials just like you see here so we can have a couple beers and learn about people, learn about their situations. And I want to think, all right, well, if I have a translator, how am I going to do my best to learn about this person or learn about this group of people? And what you realize very quickly is that you need to be very direct with how you speak. You can't really beat it around the bush because some slang or some different type of cultural talk might not go over well through the translator. It might not translate as well, but you need to find a way to connect with your clients. And how does this relate to the gym? Well, in the gym, the most important thing about being a coach is building a relationship with the client or with the athlete in front of you. I'm going to repeat that again. The most important part about being a coach is building a relationship with the client or with the athlete in front of you. Now, I think everyone knows that, but when you hear it, it kind of makes more sense. If someone is going to pay you to take them on a path for self-improvement, whether that's losing body fat or getting a little stronger or getting a little bit better in their sport, or maybe just being generally healthier, they're not going to do that with someone who, one, they don't like, two, they don't trust. So what is relationship building? Well, it's creating a connection with someone built out of trust, built out of friendship, built out of a mutual, a mutual path to get somewhere better than where you are at now. And once I kind of started teaching internationally, I realized that, okay, it's very important that we build really quality, significant relationships with all of the people in the course. I need to think about doing that with everyone at the gym, even the clients that I don't train. Because if we can create a more open environment where everyone is close with each other, my client is friends with Felix's client, who's friends with Bruno's client, that's just going to make everyone better. And that's going to make everyone a little more positive, And that's just going to help everyone progress where they want to go. So that's the most important thing is building relationships. If you can't build relationships with your clients, then you're already going to start on the wrong foot. Your ability to connect with your client is the number one thing that's important to your coaching ability. Moving on. Oh. There we go. Empathy. So empathy, when we travel places, what is empathy? If, if that doesn't translate well, your ability to put yourself in someone's shoes, that's the easiest way to say it. How well can you put yourself in another person's shoes? So when we travel, we need to be able to get out of our MBSC bubble, our Mike Boyle strength conditioning, our CFSC bubble. So if you think about where I'm coming from, we have a huge gym with all the high tech equipment, with all these air pressurized cable columns. It's, it's not realistic for most trainers. I'm very lucky to be in the situation I'm in. But if we go somewhere and we try to teach people solely based on how we do things, methods at MBSC, at CFSC, it's not going to go over well. We need to take the principles of what we do and then teach them. And in order to do that, you need to be able to empathize with the clients you're teaching. So if you think I traveled to China, for example, this gym I was in, we only had this stretch of turf and about 10 kettlebells. That's it. That was it for the entire course for four days. Got two days of level one and two days of level two. So very quickly, I need to be able to, one, realize that not every gym is set up the same way and not every gym for your coaches is set up the same way. You might have a different setup than the person who is below you on the participant list. You need to be able to figure out, all right, where is this person coming from? And how this connects to coaching is exactly that. I'm a 27 year old coach from this town. Well, I might be training a 55 year old woman with four kids who may have had a divorce or she may have had a significant event impact her financials. So I have no idea how that person feels day to day because I've never been in that situation. 
But as a coach, one thing you need to be able to do in order to build these successful relationships is be able to empathize with anyone's situation. I'm a young athletic kid with not a lot of, I don't have a lot of responsibilities to be completely honest, but if I'm training most of my clients who are going to be in the 45 to 65 years old, those are people with a lot of responsibilities. They might have very high stress jobs. Like I said before, multiple kids, right? They have a lot of financial things going on. You need to be able to understand that their life can't all be about fitness. If you're going to try and get a new client and make everything they do just about fitness, you might not be setting that person up for the most successful and positive path forward to whatever goal they're trying to reach. So I need to be able to step into their shoes for a quick second so I can realize, hey, Steve, maybe slow down a little bit. Maybe realize that this workout can't be as hard because they're a little tired because they have a newborn baby who may have been up early in the morning. So maybe we have to scale back the workout a little bit. And that might sound like a simple kind of not significant thing, insignificant thing. All right, scaling back the workout intensity. But this is something that when I started traveling, it really taught me how to do better with my clients because said, you don't know the situation. You don't know about anything. You, we always hear the kind of the moniker in the US at least, it's just don't judge a book by its cover or just hold your judgments, meet someone, get to know them. It's the same idea. I don't know what anyone's background is until I start to get to know them. So real quickly, I need to be able to empathize in anyone's situation so that we can start to build a successful, a healthy relationship and move forward. Moving on, presence, okay? What does that mean? What do you think when you hear presence? You think of someone needs to be the strong one in the room, all right? Can you lead a group? Are you the focus? And when you're teaching internationally, because of all the cloudiness of translation and it's a little slower, you need to have a presence. So when we go places, we're not macho or yelling or being overly imposing or assertive. But one thing we are doing is making sure that we have a presence that leads the room, that controls the room. Again, it's not just talking loudly or being strong but it's having some confidence to know that you can take people to where they need to go. Really, it's leadership, all right? If you listen to a team, you know what sports team has a captain, right? And that captain, even if they're not the best player, what do they usually have? One, they have a very strong presence. And they're very self-assured. So when you first start teaching internationally, you're not as confident. You've never spoken to a translator before, You've never been to a country, you're in a new place, maybe the time zone is off. That's why we love Brazil because it's only an hour ahead. But you need to still be able to come out of that with self-assurance that you are the leader and you are controlling the room. This goes back to leadership as I already said, why? Well, if you're the presence, you are the one in charge of taking people where they need to go. So if you think about how that connects to coaching, what do you think? Well, it's very simple. If I'm in charge, my client has to know that. If I do not have a presence, I am not a person with a significant amount of openness. I'm more closed. I don't talk as much. My shoulders are rounded. My posture isn't great. That doesn't really reflect well upon someone who needs to be the leader to take someone to where you need to go. As we talked, coaching is just about bringing people where they need to go for their own specific goals, regardless of what that goal is. And they are trusting in you and relying on you to bring them to that place. And if you are not someone with a presence, a significant presence, it's going to be very hard for that person to be all on board and make the positive changes that they need to, to get to where they want to be. So you need to be able to one, control a room two, get someone to trust you with, that responsibility of getting to where they need to be. And the last one, adaptability, like I said, it's a short presentation, but means a lot. So adaptability, what does this mean? Well, when we travel, there's two more actually, not the last one, adaptability. When we travel, okay, as I mentioned with that China slide, we don't necessarily know what gym we're going to be in. We don't know what space we're going to be in. We don't know what equipment we're going to have. 
we don't know the multitude of of personalities and coaching types that we're going to have in our group. For example, we have groups that are solely personal trainers for people 45 to 65. Sometimes we have coaches in professional sport. Sometimes we have physical therapists or chiropractors or massage therapists. So we need to be adaptable, one, in our ability to lead the course, and two, in our ability to speak the coach, speak coach. So we use that at the gym a lot, the word to speak coach. When you're training athletes, speaking coach means, well, if I have a soccer coach, for example, and he said, hey, why are we doing hand cleans? Uh, like we don't want to train like American football players. And then you can say, well, hey, this helps with jump height so that on set pieces and dead balls and free kicks, we can win more headers or we can win more 50-50 balls in the air. That's speaking coach. And it's the same idea when we teach a CFSC. The way that I explain a concept to a physical therapist or a chiropractor might be a little bit different than the way that I explain that same concept to someone who just trains every day, men and women, 45 to 65 year old middle-aged clients who are just trying to get in better shape, right? And when you think about coaching, what we do in our day-to-day, -day, you need to be very adaptable. How? Well, a bunch of things, like I said, Maybe the gym's busy and you can't go to where you want to go. That's a simple way. You need to be adaptable, figure out what to do. Maybe this person is the, kid, the person with the newborn baby. They wake up, they're tired, they don't want to train. You need to be able to adapt your program to the stress that the client in front of you is facing on that day. Can you take your original plan and twist it and curve it around a little bit to give the person a training effect for the day? Because if you can't do that, then you're not gonna have a lot of success. You need to be able to adapt to whatever environment is thrown at you, and you need to be able to do it quickly. So one thing teaching has done is make us realize that, all right, we might need to figure out what to do in 10 minutes, act on it, and go for it. And it's the same thing on a busy coaching floor or a busy coaching day. You might need to adapt to whatever circumstances are thrown your way. Patience, and this one, Kind of funny because you could say the patience of waiting in airports and with delays all around the world but it's more in terms of patience with translation and building all of these characteristics that i just mentioned for the last 25 minutes okay how can i build relationships how can i empathize with someone how can i create a strong presence how can i how can i uh be adaptable well you need to be patient said in a literal sense I need to speak and then pause for the translator. Well, not with Bruno, because Bruno's a pro. But you get the idea when we're teaching a course, I might have a one minute speech and then Felix or Sylvia or whoever is translating on the day is gonna then relay that back to you guys. Well, I need to be patient that, but also realize that because of that, it's gonna take more time to do all these things that we're talking about, to build the connection, to build trust, to build relationships that are meaningful and productive, it's just gonna take more time. And how does this relate to coaching? Well, coaching, in my opinion, is all about patience. We tend to have these ideals in our heads that when a new client comes on their first day or their first week, or even their first month, that we can change them very significantly. We can get them to do this in X amount of days. We can bring down their waist size in three months. But we all know that the most productive clients are the ones that are what? Consistent, one, two, over a long period of time. And over the long period of time is huge. There's no quick fixes. There's Nothing you can do tomorrow that's going to affect what happens on the next day. So you need to be patient with all of your clients. Also, where does this come back to? It comes back to be patient with building your relationship. All right. I'm going to be way better friends with someone after a year of seeing them three times a week than I am after a week of seeing them three times a week. So it takes some time to build meaningful trust and build a meaningful connection in terms of in terms of a presence, it might take some time for you to figure out how to lead that person, how to control the room, 
so that you can take them in the right place. In terms of empathy, it might take you some time to learn about their unique situations and how you can put yourself in their shoes to move them forward. So patience is really everywhere in coaching. It's, if you think about exercise technique, someone's not gonna look that great after a week compared to one year. You just need to be patient. One thing we like to say a lot is, coaching is a lot like slow cooking food. Not high gas grill or high gas burners, but slow cooking. It makes no sense to rush because you could get someone hurt, or you're just not going to get to a place. You're going to end up in a worse place than you were if you just took some time, learn where that person is, took them, take them where they need to go, and move them forward on a slow, consistent, steady pace. So what is coaching? Well, we talked about, one, building relationships. That's the most important thing. If you can't build a relationship with the client that's in front of you, then you're not going to be able to help them reach their goals. You need to be able to connect with your clients. You need to be able to get your clients to trust you in a positive way and then lead them to where they need to go. Coaching is empathizing with any unique situation. How can I take this client who has a completely different background than I do and connect with them and bring them on the right path? How can they trust me when they know that we have a different background. You need to be open and you need to teach them the way that they need to be individually taught. You need to have a presence in order to teach. I need to lead the room. I need to be in control. I need to be confident. I need to show them that I know what I'm doing. If you seem unconfident or you lack confidence in yourself, that client isn't gonna have any confidence either. You have to know where you're going and have a very strong grip on what the future looks like for that client so that you can keep moving forward. Adaptable, you need to be adaptable. We know that you need to be adaptable when coaching because everything comes up. People get hurt. People's kids are sick. People have to work a long day and then they come in tired. You need to be able to adapt your coaching style, your programming, right? your speaking to what is being shown on that day from the client. You could have a client that loves to talk all day and then one day they're tired and you keep talking at them because that's what they normally do and they just they'll just close up even more because they're tired you need to be able to adapt your coaching style to what is being shown in that minute on that hour and then patience remember you need to be very patient with all of your clients i just want to make sure that they're safe that they're healthy that we're doing the right things and get them to understand that Hey guys, this is a journey. It's a long journey. Getting better physically, getting better emotionally. It takes consistent inputs over a long period of time to get to that place that you want to go. And we all know that delayed gratification is tough because, and this is a cliche, but we all know in 2020, everyone wants something right away because everything's at the click of finger. But one thing we do know, especially with transformational change, and physical change in coaching, getting someone to become a new person through fitness, it just straight up takes time. It takes a long period of time. And we need to be the messengers of that and get everyone to understand, hey guys, I'm here with you. I'll always be here with you. You can trust me, I'll help you. But we need to be patient. We need to work hard over a long period of time and we'll get to where we need to go. Thank you. Like I said, short slide, but very impactful words. And what I want you guys to think about, think about is how those words will, can relate to the clients you're training now. Okay? Have you been doing the most to build relationships with clients? Have you been empathizing with your clients' unique situations, or you're just trying to train them in the way that you like to train? Have you been adaptable in your programming style, or you always try to fit people into one box? Do you have a presence? Are you a little more reserved? Do your clients think that they can't trust you because of that? Are you the one in control and patient? Are you just trying to rush things because you want to be quick and you want to get them to where they need to go? But are you skipping crucial steps, whether that's in the programming system you have or whether that's in the health information you relate to them? Can you be patient enough and get them to understand that, hey, these things take time to get to where we need to go? Obrigado. 
Very good. Obrigado. <clears throat> I'm glad that it said obrigado and not obrigada. No, I knew that because I remember my first time in Brazil, I said obrigado the whole time and everyone just kept laughing at me. So I learned my lesson. Okay. Very good, Steve. Thank you so much. I love this picture. <laughs> <laughs> That's real weights, by the way. Is they real weights? Come on, man. Real weights. You see that? Come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> So very good information here, Steve. Let's see if people start to write. Preguntas e respostas. I remember that. Preguntas e respostas. Huh? Yeah, we need to be back soon to Brazil, to Sao Paulo. We already have a date. De December, right? I heard. December, yes. The first week of December. You're going to feel the real Brazil summertime I, I can't wait i'm excited it'll be right in the beginning of winter so it'll be exactly what what we need yeah probably when you come back to us you're gonna say oh i'm just take the next flight to brazil again <laughs> <laughs> hey i'll stay there why not okay very good so let's see the first <clears throat> the first question here when you work with athlete, oh, from Anderson de Souza Lima, when you work with athlete, is easier because the athlete knows that this is his or her job. But um, in the other kind of an audience, what is the biggest strategy that you can use to create this buy-in situation for the client? Um, well, that's a good question. So this is something we think about empathy again. This is something that I need to empathize very much with because I work at Mike Boyle Strength and Conditioning. So the credibility is already there. And I don't need to work necessarily as hard to be credible to get buy-in because Mike has built this kind of re reputation for himself over 30 years of training athletes. But one thing I can say is if you bring it back to presence and self-confidence, if you're trying to get an athlete to buy in or really any client to buy in and you seem any bit not confident, then you're not going to create the buy-in you need. I think confidence in teaching your program, in coaching your program, in being a mentor is very important, especially with athletes, young or old. Because even though an athlete knows what their job is and they know that, hey, it's their job to train, to get stronger, to get faster, to come back from an injury, they know that. But your job is still to lead them into the right place, to guide them there. And if you are not confident in the message and the training that you are trying to supply them, they are not going to want to follow back. And one thing that's interesting with athletes is they tend to ask a lot more questions than kind of a general population client does. A general population client usually will just trust you because you're the personal trainer. But athletes, especially professional or higher level athletes, quite frankly, they know their body better than you. They've been an athlete for a long time. So they know what this means to them. They know how they like to feel on game day. They know how they like to feel in training. They might have preconceived notions of what proper training is solely because that's what they did when they were growing up. So you need to be able to one answer questions about, Hey, why are we doing this exercise? So do you know why you're doing something and are you confident in relaying that information back to the client? So I think confidence kind of in all the channels of coaching is very important when it comes to creating buy-in because if you don't have said MBSC on your shirt, you need to build your own credibility. And that comes through one, obviously your existing results, which we know are going to be good if you do the right things, but two, the confidence you have to show people that, Hey, I am legitimate. This is the way you need to be doing things. Some of these things you might've done are wrong and could injure you or whatever it is. You need to be able to be confident in your message. Very good. From Gabriel, our master coach. Gabriel. 
what these um, experience in a different cultures and training different cultures make the biggest change in your day by day? Um, um, I think the, the last one I said, the, the patience one, I tend to be very, for those of you who met me, you probably still see it. I tend to be a very bang, 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 go, go, go kind of person. I'm always kind of wired up. But the first time that I spoke with a translator, and it was something as simple as that, I never, I mean, you, you don't think about it until you get in that situation. You've never probably had to have your words translated before. So I tried to speak at a million miles an hour, and poor Renata was like, hey, and Renata was excellent in English, and she was like, hey, just like slow down a little bit. And it was like, I didn't even think about that. So I think the general patience and then how that connects to my day to day is just taking it one client at a time, right? So if I have 10 clients in two groups in one day, I can't look at it as a macro phase. You got to remember that your client is coming to you and it could be the best hour of their day. Those two hours they're with you a week could, is most likely the best part of their day. So you need to be patient and realize, hey, one client at a time, I can't think about it as I have one session 10 times. I have 10 sessions one time. I have 10 individual clients. I need to be patient with that client. I need to build the relationship with that client. And then we need to understand, like I said, with all the other patient stuff, consistency over time is what gets you to where you need to be. But I think that was the biggest thing for me was learning to kind of just <clears throat> take a breath, slow myself down and be in the moment a little bit more and be able to read the room and react to the situations at hand instead of trying to necessarily plan too far ahead for the rest of your day. Being patient throughout your day, staying connected with that client in the moment. Good. From Vinicius, our other master coach in What's Brazil, up, Vin? He's asking, um, what is the strategy do you use to memorize the names of your clients during the certification, oh. during the certification. And he's saying uh, big hugs for you. I don't, that's a good one. So this is going to sound like a, a brag or boast, but I don't know if I, I just have, I have always had the ability to do that. I could, the one thing that helps me is now this is going to sound super simple, but if you just look at the attendance sheet, so like I meet someone, we exchange names, say, how you doing? Nice to meet you. And then immediately find their name on the attendance sheet. And for me, that's really all I need. Because then once I see a name written down in person, like on paper, I can just get that click. And it's just something that, and I mean, honestly, I'll say it's a skill that I've just had. Maybe it's a, a, a memory thing, a good memory, but it's a really important thing to be able to do when you're coaching in large groups. Because as I said, well, relationship building, what do we need to be able to do? Well, we need to be able to speak to someone, that's very important. But also, what's maybe the most important thing about a relationship is remembering someone's name. So in coaching, especially groups, and you think groups of young athletes is what it comes up a lot is, I need to be able to figure out everyone's name in five minutes. And it's definitely a skill that you, need, you can practice and it will get better over time, but I don't know if I have any tricks or trades. Some people like to write down something about that person, like, hey, Felix with no hair, or like, <laughs> or this person with a goatee, a beard, or Steve with poofy hair. Like, it's something, something you can say that just gets one little click to get you to remember people. But I, I don't know, I've just never had an issue with that, which I think is probably a, a big reason of why. I'm a little successful because I can remember names. My best story with the names is we had about like 20, 25 Olympic rowers from China come over and I had never met anyone from China. And what Mike had said, it was, oh, it'll be easy to remember their names because they all like to give themselves Americanized names as like a short way because their names tend to be very long or three parts. And none of them had an Americanized name. They all just had like a normal Chinese name with three, like a three part name. And I had to remember all those names and like they were there for two weeks. So I had like a couple days to remember all their names so that I could actually start connecting with these people. That was tough. That was the hard one. So I could say anything after that is easy. Good. Good. Yeah. Some people has these um, 
skill, right? Easy like this. But it's a good strategy that you mentioned here. Another question from Camila Lima. Steve, the last few days we had a discussion at Brazilian CFSC group, is a WhatsApp group. Mm -hmm. You were talking about um, the training for women and how could we respect the hormonal cycle for women. Mm -hmm. And we also discuss about the men, tra men's trainers that could not, that had some difficult to understand this and could not put themselves on the women position. Yep. So how is these adaptations for training women on that time that they have this uh, menstrual cycle or yep. something like this? Do you have some? Uh, well, some, so that's a, that's a good question because this, I like these questions because they, they keep playing back into the words that I talked about. So if you think about empathy, if I'm a male, I don't, I don't know what it's like to be a female during the menstrual cycle. So you owe it to your clients to one, be able to put yourself in their shoes at that time of the month, but also educate yourself on what that does to the human body. So for example, I trained a, a, a women's hockey team, ice hockey team for probably like a year. And it's, it's very simple. And we all know that uh, females who tend to spend a lot of time together, their menstrual cycles start to almost align together a little bit. And there was a period every four weeks where we would have to back off a little bit because it can honestly be dangerous sometimes. Because if you think about what happens during the menstrual cycle is the ligaments in the pelvis, they start to relax a little bit. They become a little more lax because that's just what happens normally. And that's not a good time to push heavy loads or super high impact training with jumping and sprinting because it can actually be a little more risky from an injury standpoint. So if you're a male coach coaching female athletes or any female in general, you owe it to that client to learn about what that does to your body. It's the same idea as if anyone came into you with a knee injury or an ankle injury or a shoulder injury, you owe it to that client to be the expert. They're coming to you to be the expert. So you need to educate yourself on how to adapt in that unique situation. Very good. From Lucio Herbster. Um, I consider the mechanism of generate empathy with my clients, my old clients. Mm -hmm. They also looking more for health. It's a little bit more challenger and require more patience from our side as a trainers. Yep. What is your opinion about this, Steve? Uh, I, I, I agree with that. I mean, I would say the majority of my clients and I know it's funny because we're MBSC and you see all the high level athletes, the, the, the younger adults who look like they're in great shape. But for me personally, the majority of my clients are that kind of person. Maybe they have a little bit of a bump or a bruise on a shoulder or a knee or a low back. And they're just trying to get a little healthier. They're older and they're just trying to keep moving, not get any stronger, not get any faster, but prevent themselves from getting weaker or prevent themselves from losing too much power just so they can go about their daily life with a little more, with a little more pop or a little more hop in their step. And that's, I think this is maybe the most important client group because I think in general, there's such a, there's such a, a bias in fitness in the health and fitness industry to only like look at young people and what, people who are great athletes or great movers or people who can do anything do, but there's a whole population of people who just want to move around and we have a huge responsibility to help them. And that means, like we said, in terms of being adaptable with your training, well, how I train my 85 year old grandmother is not going to look the same for how I train myself or a 15 year old athlete or a 28 year old professional athlete. So yeah, I think it's, it's very important to understand differences between training for performance and training for health. That's maybe one of the biggest distinctions you can make in terms of finding a client that's coming in and realizing, Hey, they're either going to be in this bucket for training for performance or this bucket for training for health. And the majority of your paying clients 
are going to be the ones paying for health. So you owe it to them. Like you just talked about, you owe it to them to understand the difference there. Good. Um, from Juliano Holtz, thinking about empathy is possible sometimes in um, some ways that your client is a little bit down, is not so happy. Yep. Could we give them the power to decide what we could do, what we could train on these days? Absolutely. I don't have a problem with that at all. As long as it's in kind of like what we would say, the trainable menu. So say I want someone to do X exercise and Y and Z exercise are very similar. They're, they're not really that different. It's not necessarily what you wanted to do on that day. Yeah, a hundred percent. It's the, I mean, that's kind of, that's the same way we would do it with an athlete. I mean, if we have an athlete who say they had a game the night before and we're supposed to come in and do an in-season training session that next morning, and I want them to do a trap bar deadlift, but they're just tired, okay? Maybe they took a beating in the game the night before. They're mentally, emotionally, and physically drained. No problem with them electing to do a kettlebell deadlift or a single leg deadlift or even a, a hip lift variation because it's all hip dominant style exercises and you're training the same muscle groups. Yeah, it might not be what you wanted to do on that day, but you're getting in a training stimulus. And one, you're allowing that person to emotionally recover if they come in with a bad day. So I think that's, I think that's very important, whether that's coming from them choosing what to do or you telling them what to do. There needs to be options, like I said, a trainable menu that goes back to just adapting. You adapt to the situation in front of you. And yeah, if they want to choose the exercise, like I said, provided it's not something that could get them injured, um, then yeah, hundred percent, I'm okay with that. Awesome. From Juliana Borges. With all these um, strategies that you mentioned, uh, which one do you believe that is the most difficult when you put everything together if you want to be a good strength and conditioning coach? Um, well, I think obviously they, they all build together. I think it's going to be diff – this is kind of a bad answer, but it's going to be different for everyone, every coach, because even though there are some tenets of coaching that every coach in any sport, in any realm – is going to need to be able to be good at. So for example, relationship building. Everyone's going to need to be able to do that if you're a coach in gymnastics, in strength conditioning, in soccer, whatever it is. But I think the empathy part is huge. I, I really think if you can't empathize with your clients, if you can't put yourself into their unique situations, into their shoes, then it's going to be very hard to even build a groundwork for what relationship you're trying to get out of that person and for what they're trying to get out of you. So if you need to learn how to meet clients where they're at, whether that's your mother or your, your 25 year old client or your 15 or 12 year old client, your ability to take someone from where they are right now and lead them down the road is going to be very hard to do if you can't learn how to empathize with where that person is. And it sounds like it's empathize. You, you hear the word empathy and it sounds like super emotional. No, it's just, it's just a, an ability to learn about your client and give you a groundwork to build trust with. Because if, if they know that you're not even taking the time or they can see that you're not even taking the time to analyze what their needs are and build programs or build a plan out of what they need and where they want to go, then they're not going to trust you. And then the relationship isn't going to be as positive and as smooth and as fast moving as it could be. And then you're not going to be able to do any of the other things from that. You got to be able to have a good amount of empathy if you're going to be a coach. Good, good. <clears throat> um, next one here from Leonardo Oliveira. I love this one. How is the happy hour around the global, around the world? How is your relationship with different cultures? He's saying that's supposed to be really fun. Ha, um, yeah, uh, and every culture, with, well, this is what makes a culture a culture. Every culture is a little bit different. For example, in, in the US, 
if we say we're going to this bar to have a couple beers after the course and there's 50 people in the course, you might get 10 or 15 people. And it's not because they're, they don't like you or it's just, that's what people do. It's the, the, it's, it's viewed much more as like a work thing. Hey, I'm going to this continuing education for work, but then you might stay in contact with those people a little bit longer because they might have questions or email you with questions or direct message you on Instagram with the questions day after day learning about the course. Whereas in a place like Brazil, if there's a 50 person course and you say, Hey, we're going to this bar after the course to have some beers, 65 people show up because someone brings their brother or their wife or their friend. And cause that's more of the culture there. It's just more fun. It's, it's, it's more, let's say it's more easy going. The U S is very go, 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 go. Brazil is very relaxed. China, for example, it's smaller courses. I would say the biggest one I did in China is only like 20 people. Okay. But they're all very invested in the work while you're doing it. But then when the day's over, they go home and they hang out with their families. Cause that's just part of what Chinese culture is. And it's not, it's not seen as like, Hey, no one wanted to come to the happy hour. That's just what they do. They work very hard at the time in the hours where they're doing something and then they relax and they go home and they hang out with their family or with their friends. Um, Brazil's definitely up there. I would say it may be the best in terms of the social aspect and having the most fun, which I like, cause that's how I am. So yeah, but it is cool to get to understand kind of how different cultures approach social time and approach the kind of how they work while in the course. It's very, it's been very cool to learn. Very good. From Mihail, what is the what is your biggest barrier as a coach, and how do you do to change this? Ooh, biggest barrier as a coach. I think it's. I think if you go back to said, I'm not going to say the same thing with empathy. That's maybe the most important thing with a coach. But the biggest barrier I would say is 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 getting clients who you don't have a lot of things in common with and trying to build a relationship with them, whether that's me as, like I said, a 27-year-old and with a 50-year-old woman, or whether you are a, a 45-year-old man or woman and you're coaching a 15-year-old boy or girl. There's just not a lot of overlap for interests, for life experience. So that's the biggest barrier is how do you kind of cater your approach to relationship building to this client, to that client, to that client. That's, that's the hardest thing to do. And the more you do it, the better you get at it because you realize that people are more similar than different, even though everyone has their individual differences, you can kind of bucket people into categories and that's how I approach it. Um, but I think that's the biggest barrier is how do I build a, an individual connection? Okay. Cause obviously you can have kind of a fake, relationship with people but if you want them to trust you and you want to be the best coach possible you need to have a very unique individual relationship with them and that's the biggest barrier is how do i create because coaching as we all know coaching is emotionally draining for us as well i mean when you're putting all of your work into helping other people succeed and helping other people increase their emotional well-being that drains on us as well that's why when you go home and you fall asleep so quick, because we're doing a lot of work for others. And, but that's important in the sense that if I don't take that time to build a individual, meaningful, significant relationship with each person, I'm not just, Hey, I have a relationship with these five people where I kind of say the same thing to them. No, no, it has to be very individualized. So I would say that that's the biggest barrier. Amazing. From Anderson de Souza Lima. The microbial methodology is a closed system. No, he's asking, sorry, is the microbial methodology closed? But can we have a permission to add something different from the physical culture from a specific country that we are over there having the, the course, like a teaching the course? Um, I mean, I think that we, it, it seems like our system is closed at first, but I think we've learned just, like I said, from being adaptable, from learning to be adaptable in our teaching style as well, from going to different countries, we've learned, Hey, we might have to change 
the system a little bit because when we were in Brazil, we learned this, or when I was in Italy, we learned that. When I was in South Korea, I learned this. So it, it seems closed, but it's really not because it's an, it's an ever revolving door, if you will. I mean, even if you look at something like the progression regression sheet, for example, that's something that gets updated three, four, five times a year, just because we are always changing our approaches, our system. Yeah. Our principles stay the same because we have our principles, do no harm, no training injuries, and then improve performance. But the methods that are used to reach those principles or to act out on those principles are always changing with new information, what we're learning, whether that's education, whether that's someone teaching us something or that, whether that's us learning from teaching other people. So I don't know if there's, I can point to one thing in specific that one country has taught us, but I wouldn't say it's closed. It, but like I said, I would say the principles are, are set in stone, but the methods change all the time because you need to be able to adapt. Good. From Edison Hayes, did you see too much technologies difference around? Oh, hold on. Someone pop up in the question. James, <laughs> did you see too much um, technologies difference around the, the countries that you visit? Like uh, if you see something about physical training or training system, did you see something like a very um, big difference? Um, I would say the US, the fitness industry in the United States tends to be about like five to five years ahead of other places. I don't know why that is, but I would say that there's nothing in particular with a technology standpoint that makes it easier for you to be a better coach because you give me a couple dumbbells or a couple kettlebells. I can still one, put a client through a great training session and two, no matter how much high, as long as I can text my client over the phone or call them on the phone or send them an email, I can build a relationship with that client. So I don't think there's anything in terms of high tech equipment, uh, how to systemize training or plan training that really is going to affect your ability to coach. And that's honestly one thing at Mike Boyle Strength Conditioning that I think we do really well is we teach our coaches how to be a good coach first. And then we can worry about learning any new, maybe technological advance that is at our fingertips or that we've bought or whatever. But none of that matters if you can't do the basics of coaching like what we went over here today first. So no, like I said, nothing in particular, like I said, maybe in the US there's a little more advanced stuff. Uh, I know like London, some of the more Western European countries have are very similar to the US, but I wouldn't say anything significant that changes how we do things compared to anywhere else. I just think, like I said, what matters first is you being a good coach. Very good. The last one from Luciana Bruno. After this pandemic situation with the new normal, yep. in your opinion, what, do, what will really change for the new future and what would be the most important when you talk about training? Um, well, one thing that I think well, has already changed, I think online training will, will start or continue to grow because there just might be some people who don't feel like they want to return to a gym anytime soon. Not that a gym is any different than another business that is open, but I think just because People will realize that because I mean, there's people who don't like being at home, but I also think there was probably a significant amount of people during this pandemic who probably felt like, hey, I kind of like being at home and working from home a little bit more. Maybe I can be with my family a little bit more or it's a little less stressful having to commute to work or do whatever to get to work. So I think online training will continue to grow and be important. So if you are interested in that, you should educate yourself on how to create systems to train clients online, whether that's through assessment or programming or communication channels. And then the mo something that will be important with coaching is I just think, I mean, you could say things like maybe showing how clean your, your gym is or how clean you are. But I think 
what it comes down to is just more of a professionalism thing. Now that social interactions are kind of viewed with a magnifying glass, because whether that's you can't be more than or less than six feet apart, you have to social distance. I think just in general, the professionalism that you present yourself with is going to be more important because people are always, just because it's a gym and people sweat and it, it seems like a place where uh, a disease could be transmitted easier, even if it's not actually, you being a professional in all sense, whether that's how you dress, how you look, how you groom, uh, how you teach, how you coach, how you handle with clients, is just gonna overall be more important. I don't think there's anything particular with a type of training that will become more important. But like I said, your ability to show that you're professional, you're not just doing this as a hobby, is going to be very important coming back to business from the pandemic because people are just gonna, they're gonna wanna do things. If you need to create a better, a more trustworthy environment in the first place. And that starts with you being a professional. Very good. Very good, my friend. Uh, I have to say thank you so much because it was amazing and you always always have very important information to share. I like how you are simple, easy, and kiss, kiss, right? Very simple. Yeah. And um, very good, very good to hear from you. I would like to say thank you so much for our Brazilian friends, everyone that is spending this Sunday with us to learn and to be with more um, advantage with uh, new information. Thank you so much for Bruno to be here and do this uh, magic situation that he does really good. And this afternoon we have one more webinar do not miss this because it'll be really good. So Steve, do not let us before giving me back my power. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, yeah. Guys, and while I'm still here, I want to uh, obviously thank you guys for coming again. Thank you, Bruno. Exactly like Felix said, for doing what he does. Amazing. Uh, and obviously everyone send Felix an email saying thank you because he's putting in a lot of work behind the scenes to get us all going here on these presentations. So we can talk to you guys, interact with you guys. So thank you, Felix. Very good, thank you, my friend. It's my pleasure. And hope to see you soon because we now have a date. A December, line. December, let's go. Yes, level one and level two. You'll be awesome. Thank you, buddy. Enjoy your Sunday. Thank you, I will later. Bye, guys. Bye, guys. Thank you, thank you.